So a little bit about myself. Um, my background is mostly vulnerability management. That's what I do now. Uh, vulnerability scans and penetration testing, uh, the fun stuff. And then sometimes I'm like the subject matter expert for people in like a boring audit. Um, so that's that's a little bit of my background. But now I do vulnerability management, uh, uh, of which is a, is not going to be easy. So I have my work kind of for me. Anyways, um, I made this little. I'm actually re kind of representing starting back over because I started talking, and because there's time kind of whatever. So I'm re starting from the beginning. <coughs> Um, this is a cute little word cloud I made for a different slide deck I did at KSU. This is from a vulnerability scanner, Nessus, and I made a word cloud out of someone's internal vulnerability scan results. So this is what corporations look like today. And as you can see, <laughs> the biggest words are multiple vulnerabilities and remote. <laughs> like, that's not good. So. Um, yeah, uh, management, VMware is a big one. That's kind of noise. Uh, ESXi is more noise. SMB stuff, there's Freak. Um, execution, Oracle. Anyways, I thought it was kind of cute. It's a simple way to sum up where we're at in security today. Um, so here, it's a little trip and die. Um, <clears throat> this is from another slide deck. Oh, I'm not centered for whatever reason. Is that the thing or something else? Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever I unplugged it, it might have. Yeah, I'll, I'll refresh it and see if it. Cybers. Well, I'm going to change my resolution. Eight hundred by six hundred. Let's do it. Like a bounce. Okay, that's uh, better. So well, at least we we at least we can handle 800 by 600. Let's go up from there. This is how to present with a projector 101. Better? No, that's like white screen. Cool. It was working before and he broke it. That's the same, but whatever. Anyways, we'll continue. Uh, so the problem today is kind of traditional, um, non-traditional talent. Yeah. <coughs> this over. <coughs> so um, if you, any, any of you are, have had the experience and choice of hiring people or finding talent, we don't, as an industry, have the facility to find non-traditional talent, meaning the people like Mr. Robot and Palm Catch Fire folks and people that don't have degrees like myself or pieces of paper that says we know what we're doing or certifications. Um, so we need to catch, we need to find more ways to capture that talent. Um, that's a big part of why there's such a deficit within security because there's Half the people are in their basement with their moms. So um, we don't know where they are. Um, again, the other problem is like a cyber band age, right? Um, I use the term and it, you know, we're at, we're just like a gaping wound here. And we're, we haven't, I don't know if you've been in the security industry, but we just keep piling off on all this security software and things and firewalls and blinky boxes. And you take a couple steps back and you realize we're just putting band-aids over and gaping wounds and one day our kids kids will be like what you had firewalls and secure stuff and wasn't you had to do xyz and you had passwords and what the hell what's a password so we'll get there um software development life cycle people aren't writing secure software right um developers go to market and that's it they don't care about security we'll worry about it later um i think modern applications are baking in security, so you have to go like out of your way to write bad code. Um, or not bad code, but inherently insecure code. So newer code is a little safer, hopefully. Um, they're, they make it harder to be, you know, insecure. Um, cloud is gonna get worse, and privacy is already dead, and it's gonna get worse, right? 
Um, and I mentioned this, innovation is kind of halted by venture capitalists that did, can't make millions and millions of dollars off your box. So somebody might have the solution for all this, but it's not getting funded because it's not gonna make anybody millions of dollars. They can't put an agent on a Windows box, then they can't sell it, right? They can't make millions of dollars off of it. So that's, you know, we've seen some technologies come through that essentially aren't agent-based that solve a lot of these problems. Um, but because it can't have, it can't make money, and we don't have a resource to manage that box, um, we're still in the, the where we're at. Um, the basics, hard security 101, <clears throat> identity access management, passwords, password reuse, password vaulting. We need to get there, and segmentation is really bad. Um, that's the one thing that always comes up anywhere is flat networks. Um, little to no segmentation. If I can talk to 200,000 systems from my workstation, that's not segmentation. And the firewall guys will get all said, oh, our network segmented. It's like, I, if I can talk to five, you know, 200,000 hosts on the corporate network, that's not segmentation. So try again. Okay, here's uh, some random, more random, starting, starting out random stuff. So. Um, if anybody have cats that have a specific diet, like a fancy diet, well, uh, what we had to do is um, my wife had to hover over the cat bowl because one cat had a fancy, expensive food and she didn't want whatever and it was driving me nuts. She was driving me nuts. The cats were driving me nuts. So I made this little, uh, bought two RFID cat doors and then I stuck um, them into a uh, foam cutout. Don't cut foam. Melt it. So melt a knife, get it real hot, and use the knife to melt and cut instead of like getting styrofoam all over the freaking place. So, anyways, cut little holes in the door, put a partition in the middle, uh, food bowl on one end, food bowl on the other. Each cat takes about a week to train them, and they make funny noises until they finally figure it out. But <laughs> so that's why I have these. Uh, um, so if anybody has that problem or wants to play with any of that, feel free to let me know. Um, and, uh, and if you have two cats, definitely utilize those because nobody likes hovering over and cats eating other cats' food. Um, let's see, here's another random topic. Um, again, this talk is more just projects I've been working on, stuff that a lot of people don't know about. Um, I get like four views on my LinkedIn post, so it's more of a notepad for myself and to help people track what my interests are. Um, so I'm just kind of going over that and regurgitating uh, stuff that nobody looks at. That's fun. <clears throat> so, so here, who here has to work through like corporate proxies and can't go to certain websites and they get filtered, right? Everybody's on a corporate network or something that gets filtered. Um, easiest way to do that is to set up um, OpenWord or use OpenVPN. A lot of companies are gonna allow OpenVPN access um, if you have the capacity, set up a Cisco VPN, um, you have to be able to check your corporate email, right? So they just allow anybody to connect securely over the internet, but they'll block Facebook. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's for the, it's for Sally and accounting, right? That's what the proxy's for. It's for, you know, people trying to go to websites they shouldn't. But from a logical standpoint, it's freaking hilarious because, you know, it's like, oh, I can't, I can't tunnel out. I can't SSH out. I can't proxy out. Nothing's let me go out. Oh, well, I can open VPN and, and secure all my traffic. What's the point? So um, here's a quick example. Figure out if the firewall is stateless or not, or whatever the term is. So is the firewall just blocking a port? Or is it looking at the traffic and the protocol and saying, no, you can't do SSH over port 80. You monkey. I'm going to block you. So. A quick way to figure that out is to nmap login.oscar.able.com, which is like AIM's login servers, which have every single port open. Um, AIM and all the, the instant messengers, like Skype is the worst. Like if you want to traverse your network, Skype was really good about getting out of the internet, getting out, bypassing proxies and players, because everybody wants Skype to work. So Skype just like allows everything to be open and will tunnel out and try to get out the, the best way it can. So. Um, you scan that, find out what open ports are, 
pick a random port. Usually the random ports are better than like 8443. So if you have obviously 8443, you're gonna be open because that's the internet, right? So I usually find some random port that like, I don't even know it's attached to a service that's open. And that's usually a, a non or a stateless port that I can tunnel whatever traffic I want over it. But if it doesn't work, you know you have stateless people are looking at the traffic and they're dropping it because like you're trying to tunnel over port 4481, like what, and it drops you. So um, that's the easy way to find out if you're being blocked or not. Here's a, has anybody ever asked with like proxy chains before? Proxy chains? You want to grab a, a toy? What you got? All kinds of stuff, a, a camera hat, shirts, a little mug, a audio splitter, HDMI, 500 gig hard drive. Ant farm, little tool thing, <laughs> cat door. <laughs> what, the ant farm swing? Okay. Anyways, um, yeah, so this is basically proxy chains for Windows, and not a whole lot of people know about this application. So here's your SSH tunnel. If you don't know anything about SSH tunneling, um, and I, this is Putty, and I've tunneled SSH into a server that's not on the corporate network, right? And they're allowing port. Um, you know, 443, but they're allowing SSH to go over 4443, which saves you a lot, right? So I have a tunnel, but um, uh, I don't have network layer uh, permission to change the proxy settings in Chrome. So that's where uh, Proxyfire comes in. And Proxyfire is basically a Windows application that's essentially proxy chains. So proxy chains lets you tunnel at least all TCP traffic over for over your proxy for um, any application you use. So you do proxy change bash, and all anything that you run after that command, all the traffic is going to tunnel through your proxy. And with proxy chains, the actual real Unix Linux proxy chains, you can connect chain a bunch of proxies together. So you can have like you know like you see in the movies, and the guys like proxying through like 17 proxy service. That's how they do it with kind of an example of proxy chains. So you can have, a, you can have uh, some proxies let you do proxy chaining essentially. So you can have a list of like uh, my proxy chains comp has got like 60 or 100 proxies in it and you can proxy chain at least two or more together and then your traffic gets proxied through multiple proxies or whatever. Anyways, um, so that's an example of how to use proxy chains. But this is proxy chains for Windows. So if the application you have doesn't support proxy, then you can use proxy chains and it, all the traffic after you launch proxy chains, everything you run after that, it hooks and all your traffic goes over your tunnel. So it's pretty freaking awesome. I used it for WinApp way back in the day and WinApp didn't have a proxy setting. So I used Proxyfire to tunnel all my traffic over it over uh, to bypass to firewall to get to the stuff I wasn't supposed to get to and listen to music. <clears throat> All right, any questions, any comments? Uh, feel free to add uh, anything I'm talking about um, that you think you can add value to or anything that I should look at if any of this interests you or whatever, feel free to sync up with me or just say, hey, I know about this, that, and then schooler. So anyway, sorry. Um, Portable applications, if you haven't, if you're a Windows person, you haven't messed with portability, um, it is definitely something to check out. I don't install anything but like VMware, 7-zip, Notepad++, and like WinPCAP. That's all I install on a Windows box. Everything else is portable. Um, Office, of course, because we're not gonna go into portable Office, because that's annoying. So, uh, portablelabs.com is free. They have tons of different portable applications. Um, most of mine are rolled or found somewhere else or not made it myself. So here's some examples of portable application virtualization platforms to help you build portable apps. Uh, Spoon Studio is pretty good. Um, it's a GUI interface to, um, I don't know if you ever use any of those registry cleaners or any of that crap. So it was, back in the day they had, you, you install the registry cleaner, and then you turn it on, and then you install your app, and the registry cleaner app like sniffs everything that happens with Windows, 
and then when you're done, it captures that. And then when you uninstall the app, you go to the registry cleaner thing and it says, oh, I, you know, gonna delete all of these registry keys for you and clean up the thing. That's when Windows registry was just a mess and you had to have registry cleaners. And you had to like monitor your registry for people like breaking stuff. So it works that same way. And it also virtualizes like the registry in most cases. And um, so Spoon Studio is a good one. VMware ThinApp is another non, is a commercial one. And Cameo, how, did, how do you pronounce that? Cameo or whatever, um, is a free one. So if you want to play around with application virtualization and bundling your own portable apps, uh, that, that bottom one is a good, word, good place to start. Um, because you can essentially make portable anything that you want. Um, and it also works for most of the time uh, commercial software. So you install, you run uh, ThinApp, and then you install the app, activate it, turn on the license, and then make the snapshot. And then you can just copy to your USB stick and run it, and not have to worry about you know SIDs matching or computer name matching or interface matching or serials or keys or um, sometimes they hide serial stuff, uh, license stuff inside of uh, NTFS. Alternate data streams, that's fun to play around with. I haven't played around with that. Alternate data streams, you can hide stuff. <laughs> what, are these, what do these products give you? What do they do for you? They allow you to virtualize applications and, and make them portable in most cases. So um, the example would be if you're on somebody else's computer and you want all your extensions, all your plugins, all everything to just work, you can use one of these to build a portable version of, not really Chrome, but a, a, a basic binary in most cases. And all you have to do is just put it on USB stick, copy it to the cloud, whatever. So I have like a six gig USB folder that has all my portable stuff in it, like media, viewers, internet stuff, security folders that set off AV, and all kinds of crap. So um, I've been building that over the past 15 years of just stuff, and there's really old stuff in there too, but. Um, that's what it helps you do, and um, it, it, I, as an IT person, you're going to be on a lot of people's computers, right? Um, and as a post-exploit person, you're going to be on a lot of people's computers, and to have that portability is second to none because you don't have to install anything and there's little to no footprint. And a lot of them, actually, when you screw something up, it's very easy to fix it. You just rename the folder of where your data stored, gets stored within the portable application, and it goes back to when you first ran it. So you can essentially have snapshots of your virtual app application as you run it. So you can have backups of your data folder and you can go back and be like, oh, well, what was I doing at this point? And for, if it breaks, if it breaks, you can go back and fix it. So. Yep. Um, here is another tool or set of tools that I kind of bundled together to make idiot proof. I talk really quick, so I mumble because it's still early for me. But anyways, uh, here is SAP uh, Bisploit, which is from Onapsis. So, does anybody show hands? SAP? Anybody mess with SAP? Oracle or like Microsoft SQL? The new Microsoft SQL stuff. So, a lot of these things during vulnerability assessments and pen tests are overlooked. Like, you know, your old school. Um, you know, like old OS's, ZOS, and all that stuff are overlooked. And this is one of the ones that's overlooked is SAP. So um, I worked with SAP a, a fair amount. It's from a pen test vulnerability assessment. And I wanted an easy way to automate scanning SAP systems. And that's where this comes in. So it has its own in that. And it has BizBlink with all the scripts in it. So you feed it an IP list of hosts you want to scan that have SAP or you think might have SAP, and automatically in-maps it, scans it, finds the open ports, feeds that to Bisploit, runs all the vulnerability checks for Bisploit, dumps out an HTML document, and will give you a report of like, you know, four out of the 10 SAP servers have remote code execution on it. And a lot of important stuff is on SAP. So there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in that area that gets overlooked because Vulnerability scanners don't do this. They don't check for SAP stuff. They don't check for web app stuff. And that, that's a whole other conversation. 
Um, have any of you ever had to, made a good point over here, had to download something and then upload that to a server? Like, that's the most annoying thing to do in the world because you have to log in to VMware to download anything. So you have to download this, you know, you know, 50 gig thing, and then you have to push it somewhere, and there's no easy way to, to download it. Um, this is a example of a multi-threaded downloader via command prompt. It's ARIA2, A-R-I-A-2-C. Um, this allows you to eat, to feed it a list of URLs in a, in a file, and this is how many like slices or swarms to download it, so we want four uh, chunks and then four like max connections, and we want to download all these URLs, put it in this folder, and I don't remember what that does, but um, that's a pretty cool app. So uh, another example is using Burp Suite, which is a local proxy, and inside Burp Suite, you can run Burp Suite, sniff all your traffic, log in to whatever dumb website you're trying to download something from, and push to another server. You log into there, and then the very last request you get, because what happens usually, if you if you ever looked at what happens when you actually download something, nowadays you get like you click a download link and you get forwarded off to like a CDN concert distribution network, and then you get like 404 to here, and then 302 redirect over here, and then you get, and the whole time you're passing cookies and authentication to God knows how many different places, and you're like passing all this authentication and cookie and picking up 404s and redirects. And then, like six requests later, you actually get your executable or your file. So the problem with that is you can't do that remotely, right? You don't have a browser that like will run Java unless you use like like Phantom JS or Selenium or something. But um, the way to do that is in Burp Suite. Once you had that last request, you can say right-click the, the request and say copy as curl command, and then you just dump that straight into your command line thing and it'll download whatever executable or whatever the file is doing. So I use that a fair amount when I'm downloading either ISOs or you know uh, images to servers. And, and then you get the idiots that are like, oh, I gotta upload 16 gigs to this thing, I'll download it, and then upload it to the server. Well, with curl and uh, burp suite, you just right click, copy the curl command, paste, boom, and you start downloading. And, Add to that multi-threaded, and you get it even faster. So it's a fun little. Uh, it's on LinkedIn. A lot of my, a lot of this is just my brain dumps and LinkedIn posts that I cobbled together uh, this morning and yesterday. <coughs> this is going to go over Chrome. I actually use Software Iron or Iron. Does anybody use that? It's like a non-Google Chrome. Essentially. I don't know how much I believe it, but I, I, my portable Chrome, Chrome got screwed up because if you log into Chrome, your extensions almost get like uh, uploaded to the cloud or something, and then they get like encrypted or something. It basically makes portability not work. So if you ever have like portable Chrome, portable Firefox, I don't need to think it does it with Firefox. It's just a Chrome thing. So once you log in with Chrome, it like puts your extensions in the cloud or something. And it, screws up portability. So anyways, um, this is my uh, kind of a brain dump of how my Chrome is set up. Um, if you don't have any cloud backups or backup your stuff to cloud, uh, Amazon has O-Drive, or there's O-Drive that w works for Windows, and then Amazon e EC2 or Amazon's cloud service is $60 a year. So um, they're trying to compete with folks like Dropbox. Now it's not idiot proof quite yet. Um, I don't know if there's any better options out there for syncing with the cloud with Amazon Cloud besides O-Drive. Does anybody know anything that's better than O-Drive? No? Um, anybody worked with O-Drive? Damn it. You're supposed to help me. Anyways, O-Drive allows you to sync all your cloud content. So they have, they have uh, hooks for like Dropbox and Amazon and all of the cloud storage things. And then it's like all your files everywhere. So they have like an O-Drive for Android and whatever. And they have like a monthly subscription of like $5 a month. The free one will allow you to sync uh, to Amazon Cloud and it's uh, free. And then Amazon 60 bucks a year. So I've heard people getting up to a terabyte with Amazon Cloud and not having any problems. 
So that's pretty ridiculous. Anyways, uh, I'll sync all my stuff to the to Amazon, the USB folder I was talking about. I'll sync that to the cloud. Um, so here's my Chrome extensions. LastPass, if you're not doing password vaulting, stop everything you're doing and go install a password vault. LastPass is like, what, $15 a year or something? So find a password vault. If you want to do it locally and you don't find your passwords in the cloud, do it locally and encrypt it or whatever you want to do. Um, but I just use LastPass, password one, any of those folks. Uh, Adblock Plus, of course, to block ads. Don't want to go into the dynamics of why you should block ads or why you shouldn't, anything. Um, Turbo Download Manager is again, it's kind of like a multi-threaded downloading application. Uh, get them all also a multi-threaded or downloader for plugins. Uh, Tamper Monkey allows you to essentially dynamically mess with content in the browser. So there's tons of like Grease Monkey scripts out there for basically any website you want to look a certain way or to remove copious amounts of BS. So there's a lots of plugins for like LinkedIn, lots of plugins for Grease Monkey scripts for um, like Facebook or so if you, it's essentially if you, if you're on a website that's annoying, there's probably a Grease Monkey script to not make it annoying. There's thousands upon thousands of Grease Monkey scripts. And they also sometimes have legal issues because, you know, if you're futzing with stuff and they get a big enough footprint, then they'll like kind of code, change the code up so that the Grease Monkey script doesn't work anymore and then somehow it mysteriously disappears from off the website and you're like violating some kind of terms. But anyways, um, uh, let's see, Ghostry is an anti-tracking. So I've seen up to like 26 trackers on one website. So that's... Yeah, how you feel about tracking and ads. So this blocks ads. You need to do more than just block ads. You need to block trackers. Um, another one is uh, Magic Actions for YouTube. That one's kind of shifty, but I haven't really done an assessment of it. But it makes YouTube look awesome. You can take out comments. You can just make YouTube just display the video and not all the crap that's wrapped around it, right? Um, so Magic Actions for YouTube is good. Some of the Grease Monkey scripts I have that are vital are uh, anti-ad blocker, which is, uh, if you ever played video games back in the day, they had a thing called Punk Buster. Like, does anybody mess with Punk Buster? Ever had to hear, hear Punk Buster? Yeah, it's old school. I think they still use it. I don't know if Valve uses it. If somebody uses Punk Buster, because I, I think it's on my, my gaming machine. Anyways. This is a Punk Buster Buster Buster, but for ads. So it's an ad blocker blocker blocker. Or I don't know if I said blocker. Did I say blocker enough? I don't know. Anyways, so if you, who, you know, the website that you go to that says, please disable your ad blocker to continue to view this website. These guys are all about getting around that and still keeping your ad blocker uh, doing what it's supposed to be doing. So donate to the cause. Don't donate to the cause, but um, that is a critical thing to have in your browser is an anti-ad blocker, 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 blocker. Uh, YouTube links, again, it kind of works in conjunction with Magic Actions to give you um, really cool interface to YouTube. And I don't actually watch YouTube videos from their player. I go to YouTube and then I right click YouTube links and download the multi-threaded of the YouTube video in like eight seconds. And then I watch it with VLC. I don't use YouTube's player, I don't look at their crap, and you know, sometimes I'll utilize YouTube for player playlists and things like that. Uh, so Robert, um, so do you use uh, uBlock Origin then? uBlock Origin? No, I have to add that one to my, uh, my list here. So what, is that, what does that do? It's just the same as like AdBlock Plus. Okay. But it functions so more like a firewall. Parties. Yes. Uh, and same with Ghostry, it disconnects the different version that doesn't sell their stuff to third parties. And nice, nice. Well, the reason I'm stuck with um, Adblock Plus is that's how anti-ad blocker works. And I think anti-ad blocker supports a couple of other ad blockers. So I might look into switching from uh, Adblock Plus because they have the acceptable ads checkbox or whatever on by default. I'm not too concerned about it. I just don't want the internet to look like the internet. <laughs> I don't want my content to look like content. 
Does anybody have any other favorite extensions for Chrome that I'm missing that are like vital? HTTPS always or everywhere? Yeah. Everywhere. HTTPS everywhere, that's a good one, which breaks the internet. It's like NoScript. I mean, NoScript just breaks the internet. So I have it installed, but I have always disabled it, <laughs> like everybody else in the world. Because the problem with NoScript, and I've been trying to work around this, I don't know if anybody has a solution, but everybody has uses content distribution networks. So you go to Amazon.com, and none of the content is from Amazon. It's all from the CDN. So then you're like, at CDN, at CDN, at CDN, at CDN, and then finally some of the website loads. And like, well, which one of these 15 websites has the content I need? So I think NoScript is in a bad position because it, the CDN's like broke NoScript. So I don't know if it, it takes a while to tune it really well. Really? But you have to tune it. mess with it a lot. And, uh, uh, when you first install it, you're going to be doing that for days. Basically, manually whitelisting everything. everything. What, what I was hoping is maybe, I looked on their forums, and I was hoping that maybe had somebody had like a whitelist list of CDNs that I could feed into NoScript, which kind of defeats the point of NoScript, but I wish I had a whitelist of CDNs I could just dump into NoScript and like the internet would mostly work, right? Like Akamai and whoever all the other CDNs are, but NoScript is useless, essentially. Um, here's some story times. I've got a fair amount of time. I might just end up wandering around my LinkedIn page because I talk too fast. Um, here's PowerShell Empire. Um, he, PowerShell has become very popular within the security community as a post-exploit tool because PowerShell lets you do anything. Um, run stuff in memory, bypass AV, everything. So. Um, these guys have been putting a lot of stuff together and merging a lot of PowerShell scripts and tools and binaries and like making just like, it's basically Metasploit for post exploit. Uh, it does all kinds of cool crap. Uh, runs in memory and PowerShell is basically on every Windows computer nowadays. But this is an example of what a payload would look like, just a bunch of job you. And I'll, I'll go into that. But uh, if you haven't played with, if you want to get into hacking and stuff, just start with PowerShell and, and go from there um, and skip a lot of your uh, old school stuff. And that's the new hotness people are using. Uh, what is it, Veil or Veal Framework is a good one to play with too. Between those two and like Metasploit, if you figure all three of those tools out and then work backwards from there and actually understand how they work, why they're getting blocked, things like that, you can be a pen tester very quickly. So here's an uh, example from a real client we had. This is what happens every time we do pen test. You find, um, this was actually a physical test we did. So I'm, uh, USB Ducky, which is a programmable human interface device, which is essentially a programmable keyboard that you can put whatever you want. So what I ended up doing is making a PowerShell Empire payload for the ducky and you can just plug that into any computer that's not locked or whatever and get a shell now I know the hack five guys came up with some kind of USB stick you plug in that does some kind of without unlocking the computer makes a tunnel does anybody have any details on that the land turtle land, land turtle. turtle okay because I know they had something called the turtle before that but I don't really understand how it works so I need to look into that or not it because it shows up as an Ethernet device. Yeah, you can use yeah. it as a control. It's to plug in and then you port. set up a tunnel. Yeah, it's you a, can do that. Yeah, it, it's a. It's basically it's a Unix box or a Linux box. Yeah, yeah. Embedded and it, but when you plug it into the machine, it shows up as an Ethernet device and then you can tunnel oh. into it. And they've got a bunch of scripts. They you can do VPN or SSH tunnels or whatever you want without the computer being locked, right? I think. Or that, unlocked. I think that was. Recently, the where the uh, Mubix found out that domain hashes were just being sent yeah. every time you plugged into a network, mm -hmm. and yeah. he was using that to capture it. And yeah, you could just decode nice. it. Nice. So it's not giving you access to that computer um, physical, like it's not unlocking the machine. It's just giving you network layer access to that machine. 
right? Yes. On the network, on the network, network interface. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's almost like a pen test Dropbox, mm -hmm. yeah. basically. But so I, I was hoping it was like some kind of magical thing that like automatically gave me access to any computer <laughs> without unlocking it. But that makes sense. That's better than better than nothing. But anyways, um, we had an Empire pay PowerShell payload as the, for the payload, and this client did two bad things. They did everybody has administrator, and UAC is disabled. Don't do either one of those, and certainly don't do them both at the same time. So if you're in a company and you have administrative rights and you have UAC turned on, go slap somebody because that shouldn't happen. Um, even if you're an IT guy, you need to be able to, you need to be doing it right. Uh, don't run around with domain admin and you should have multiple accounts and that whole thing. Anyways, so Sally walks away for, from her computer to actually go in a meeting that I was in with her. So she goes to the mute room and doesn't lock her machine and I plug in the ducky and get a shell to her computer while we're sitting in a meeting together. Uh, it's gonna, it just could have been as well anybody else on the board, but so you have access to that system, no UAC, administrator level access, you can dump credentials. Does anybody mess with any cats? Hands? Any cats? Um, there's another one called uh, Windows Credential Editor that's just a command line tool that not a lot of people know about that has two different binaries. And they just dump plain text. It's like Mimi Cats, but it's just a single executable. Uh, fun to play with. A lot of AV picks it up. And not so much Mimi Cats in memory at least. Anyways, so we were able to get the plain text password and or hash to that system, to Sally's box. And then what I like to do is you get credentials, you spray it across the network, and then whatever access you get, then you try to escalate there, and you keep spraying, get credentials, spray, get credentials, spray, and monitor all the boxes along the way <laughs> until you find a domain administrator, and then you hijack that, and then you have domain administrator. So the, the process here is Sally's computer, administrator, dump credentials, spray it across the network. We have access shell on like 55 Windows systems. Then we dump the plain text of like Timmy, the IT guy, who's not a domain admin, but he has a local admin to every single box, which is essentially domain admin. So poor Timmy, I get his plain text password. Then I log into domain and add myself, oops, add myself to the domain administrators group. And then the fun thing to do once you have domain admin is to log into um, Exchange, if they have a use Exchange. In some instances you can dump the plain text credentials of everybody, everybody's email, right? So we got like 295 plain text passwords. So we were able to log in as whoever we wanted to, you know, CIO and get that impact and show people that says, you know, not only did we get domain admin, which nobody cares about, you show them a screenshot and say, hey, this is the CFO's email. And they're like, oh, crap. So um, showing impact and finding that level of fuzziness to say, is, is this going to scare anybody? Or do we need to like put this off the table and just tell IT that we got domain admin? Or do we need to scare people? And usually, you can, you can get a feel for that from the client and, and go from there. So that's a pretty good example of how things how targeted attacks and stuff goes down. So your foothold in this scenario was with the with like the initial meeting with the client? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was um, not the initial meeting, but when we were on site doing physical, they gave us access to a conference room. And uh, actually I was in, a, before that I was in a maintenance closet that I wasn't supposed to be in because the doors were too far apart. So you could just like shove a paper clip and open the door. So we got, some maintenance guy's USB stick and copied a bunch of stuff off of it and got like plans for the all the layout of the, all the floors of all the buildings because he was a maintenance guy, so he had all these plans and layouts. And, um, so that was kind of some of the stuff. But, but yeah, we were tests. We were set in that room, and then Sally went off to join the meeting, and I said, well, we're doing physical tests, so I might as well take advantage of it. And that's where I did. So that was the initial foothold into the, into the system. Um, usually now it's just passwords, password guessing. Um, spring 2016, spring, winter 2017, whatever it's going to be coming up. 
and you check, usually you check the two latest passwords, password spring is what they call it. Um, so you guess, um, I, I was overcomplicating the whole brute forcing, right? I was like taking client name and like obfuscating it and like having like, you know, the word, the client name and then like seven different ways to spell it, like week speak and then I was feeding that and it's not that hard. You get a dump of all the users, so you have like 30,000 users on the, on the domain and then you password spray with like spring 2015 and then you get eight shells. And you're like, oh, well, I'm, that was a way, I was overcomplicating it. So, with that said, that's that's an easy way. Password spraying's fun. Um, that's how most of the time you're going to get local lateral access to to boxes just by guessing. Welcome one two three or whatever. They're, figure out what their password policy is and build a couple of passwords just to spray across all the users and hopefully not get them all locked out. <clears throat> um, here's another kind of story time. Um, we talked about this one. Uh, Mousejack. Is anybody familiar with Mousejack? Played with it before. Um, this, these guys came out with a thing called Jacket, which is a script that runs on top of, or in lieu of mouse jack that like makes it all the Um This is basically just me skidding all of it, Skitty powers activate. But anyways, um, so mouse jack allows you to inject keys, or uh, Jacket is this automated script to, to inject keyboard commands into like wireless mouse toggles. So, um, selling and accounting or has a has a wireless mouse and you can inject keys into it and this helps you automate that pal uh, that process um, the payload of course I usually use is um, an empire pay payload empire shell payload so um, and it really works almost everywhere everybody has wireless devices so the what I'll usually do with it is I'll um, it's a crazy radio PA dongle, it's like 50 bucks. And apparently there's another one that you can do that's even cheaper that will get all the Logitech stuff. But anyways, you s essentially snake through all the cubes to find all the wireless mice. And then you kind of stand in the, in the middle of all the cubes and like launch the payload a couple times. And then you just start seeing shells pop up on your remote box. So you're injecting keyboard commands into other people's wireless mouse dongles that don't even have a keyboard plugged into it. <laughs> um, so that's a cute little uh, piece of technology. Not a whole lot of information about it. Um, there was a DEF CON talk, I guess, that I missed some, some need to look up on. Uh, here's some more kind of random stuff. Kind of command line foo. I think I've got a few more slides. Let's see. We're at time here. Yeah, doing okay on time. So, um, here's um, I run as administrator on my gaming machine, and when you try to run Chrome as a different user, it just crashes. And the way Chrome works, it has its own sandbox and it does all this stuff and launches a billion processes for Chrome. Um, this is a way to get around that. So, if you're running as an administrator at least do this um, with Chrome. Um, this will, you create a new user that has no admin <coughs> rights and you're browsing with a limited user and if you turn the sandbox mode off, that will help you, allow you to run as a different user with Chrome as a limited user. And that way you can, you can run as admin administrator on a Windows box, but you don't have to worry about getting popped through Chrome or whatever because you're running it as a different user that has limited rights. So that's what I do on the gaming machine. I don't browse as administrator. I always use Chrome, and sometimes I accidentally use Internet Explorer and realize that, oh, I'm an administrator, don't you know? Um, another fun one to play with is uh, Knox App Player. I did a talk a couple years ago about um, uh, Android portability, and uh, if you want to get into Android uh, development and or figuring out how applications work. Knox App Player, um, it's like from China.com, so it's a little shifty. I wouldn't really trust it, but it makes it idiot proof. Like Knox App Player is, if anybody, has anybody ever messed with a, uh, what's the one, like jelly bean, jar of beans, or blue stacks? Anybody, blue stacks? Yeah. Blue stacks is so horrible. 
Um, Nox app player is awesome, except for it's like China.com, and I don't understand why they're giving it away. I think it's Windows only, and it actually used, I think it uses a portable version of uh, almost like a VMware or a VirtualBox or something, because it has uh, VMDKs or whatever, or VDI uh, extensions, so I don't know, it's like a portable virtualization suite thing, but anyways, um, Nox app player is freaking awesome, because it lets it gives you root, and easy, you can drag and drop apps into it, you can... Um, I use I used it for my presentation using an Ox app player with Burp Suite, and you can sniff all the traffic of whatever app you're playing with inside an Ox. So the reason I developed it, all this was that I was testing client applications with my personal <laughs> device, right? Um, so I said that A is not shouldn't be doing that, and B uh, I don't want somebody's client's garbage software screwing with my phone because uh, Lord knows what it's doing. This uh, simple and simple things like. The client app that I was testing was for a theme park, and the theme park had the the app had a inside of it. It had an application for um, you know find me a shop find shops right. So to do that, you need GPS. So okay, that's fine. You can have my GPS, whatever. But um, it was actually sending my coordinates to the client, even though I wasn't in the theme park. And it's like, why are you collecting GPS coordinates when I'm not in your theme park? So it should be like, only send GPS coordinates if you're in this box, GPS box. So for whatever reason, they're collecting everybody's geolocation when they launch the application, even though they're not in the park. So everybody is collecting all information and we're still trying to figure out what we're, corporations and everything are trying to figure out what to do with this data. And as they figure it out, privacy is just going to go even worse to the crapper and eventually we'll all stand up and go crazy and encrypt everything. I don't know what, what the solution is, but uh, that's an example of using Knox. Uh, Census.io, has anybody ever played with that? Offline scans, offline data. Um, uh, it was a project of mine where we sent some work off to a third party internally and I was like, get the client's external fingerprint and they came back with like 16 IPs. I'm like, okay, that is not their fingerprint. They like, they must have hundreds and tens of thousands of websites across the internet. So I started looking at, uh, you know, recon, passive reconnaissance and you can essentially download scans of the internet that these guys have done like basic stuff like 480, 443, SSL certificates, so you can essentially work with a client and before you even sign any kind of letter of authorization, you can say, hey, look, here's all your SSL servers that have Heartbleed. It's like, here's your external footprint and here's 15 servers on your network that have externally facing that had Heartbleed on them. And like, what? How did you find that? We're, you haven't even signed, done any work? We haven't done any work yet. Well, every, everybody's already done the work. So you download like a terabyte and a half worth of data and you just parse through it and you can make all these cool assumptions and, and graphs about how the, the client footprint is. Um, who gets the annoying get Windows 10 update message? Multiple times. Update to Windows 10, no, nobody? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is, uh, they finally, after the second, they pushed multiple kinds of updates. Anyways, this is a registry key to get rid of that nag um, for update, Windows update 10. Um, here's how to set file associations via the command line. So again, I don't install applications, any apps on Windows. So I don't have any file associations for any of my apps. So it poses a problem, right? So I have a bat script that essentially rolls through a list of file associations and sets them as, uh, as the player. So um, here's two command lines to set file associations in Windows. Um, this is just using VLC for every type of file extension that has to do with movies, and I just run it. It's called acc.bat, and boom, all my file associations are, are set inside of Windows. That's a fun one. Control your file associations. I also have one that's called F-Type Wipe that will wipe all remnants of Windows Media Player file associations, because who's, who's here to click on a movie and it opens up Windows Media Player and doesn't play? When has Windows Media Player ever played any of the videos you clicked on? 1999. 
99. 99? Yeah, when like everybody was, the only good codec was, what was it, WMV? That was the only one that people were using, was like. So that, that's how I use it. F-Type wipe, wipes all the file types for, uh, for uh, video applications and gets rid of all Windows Media Player bullcrap and it will never open with the Windows Media Player until you update Windows Media Player and then it stomps all over your freaking registry keys again. Anyways, um, here's a quick one. I think I have a few more minutes. Oh shit. Yeah, I have a few more minutes. Uh, here is the, uh, I do Myth TV or actually Cody, Plex, Couch Potato, Sonar, anybody? Anybody? Plex? Maybe we can swap Plex accounts. We need to have a Plex party and just everybody swap Plex accounts. Um, I've been gotten into TV more recently and the past couple of years setting up all this stuff. But what I found is that my, a lot of TVs are very dark. Um, so these guys, the ABS HD people, um, came out with a, a set a DVD set of all kinds of stuff to calibrate your, your stuff. Um, that's really good to calibrate your TV and get those black levels correct. Um, and what else is good on there? Black level clipping is what the one, the video that's actually on my site that's good for doing black levels. You can also order a blue filter, like a, almost looks like 3D glasses. And you can filter the color and all that shit, which I haven't done yet, um, and make the colors perfect, all well, close is perfect without having an actual scanner. Um, here's some references, notes. Uh, my website, of course. Um, if you're, if you want to track uh, security feeds or uh, like updated and security news, um, my support side scripts feeds is a bunch of RSS feeds that I parsed like like 2014 or something. So half of them are probably useless, but I still look through it from here from time to time. Uh, the idea was to create one RSS feed for all like exploits or, or publicly released exploits. So I could look in there and be like, oh, there's a thing for BSD. Shit, I run BSD. Let me go and update that. So it's kind of a little thing to watch. Um, uh, what do you call it? Threat intelligence is the, is the term we're using now, right? And it's threat intelligence at its, at its, uh, at its finest. Um, also, an easy win to security or understanding about how security works is um, all these podcasts. They're kind of sorted in order of, of the ones I like that are more technology focused. Um, if this one's actually not really uh, technical, but it gives you an idea of what you should buy within Enterprise, and they give you the, Paul and Paul Asadorian and whatever the other guys, they give you a, an honest opinion about a product and they'll say, that's garbage, and I don't even know what it does, and their website says, but it, so. Um, risky Business is good. Um, that's a security podcast, Liquid Matrix. Southern Fried Security Podcast is actually in Atlanta, I think. So, Polycom Security Weekly, uh, Securebit. So, there's some good uh, security feeds to keep an eye on. Um, I think that's most of my time. Uh, but usually, you can just scan through by a LinkedIn profile and get an idea of the, the stuff that I play with. Um, little one liners, scripts, stuff to make Windows, you, most of it's Windows. There's free updates for Cisco. So if you don't have a support contract for Cisco, you call up and say, hey, I'm being exploited against the CVE, and they have to give you binaries for it. So that's how you get free updates for Cisco, is you call them up and say, hey, I'm getting owned via extra bacon exploit, and they'll give you the latest, greatest. Um, well, they will give you the, they will give you the oldest binary they will to fix that patch. That vulnerability. They won't give you the latest one, but they'll give you the last one that fixed the vulnerability that you, I'm like, come on, man. So in three months, I have to call you back up and say, I'm getting attacked by this vulnerability. Give me another binary. So they don't like me very much there. Because uh, I call them up and like, and then I had to try to get another guy to do it. He could, he, he's like, thanks, handing you a support contract. No, no, you're doing it wrong. You gotta, you gotta keep hammering on them and keep opening up tickets. And eventually they'll give you the binary, so it takes a while. But um, anyways, any questions or comments? Uh, there's the file scene, take control, take control of your files um, for VLC. Um, there's a uh, attribution, flash-based attribution tool. It's kind of funny. Come on, man. Anyways, it's a flash-based thing that says like, you know, you shake the ball and it says, you know, 
insider thread or China or little bobby tables. And I added some like some custom ones. Enter um, webs. Yeah, here it is. It's flash, so it won't really work for that much much longer. Bobby tables. This should work. I'm gonna download it. Do I have flash installed? Let's find out. Yeah. So, you know, you could be. And if you have a threat. So, oh, teenager. And Rob Graham. I actually stole this from uh, du Dual Labs. Yeah, yeah, Dual Labs. Because they wouldn't send me one of the attribution eight balls, so I had to make a flash based one. I'm supposed to get to. <laughs> so, you can use this when you're. You know, CFO asks you how you got compromised. You just go here and click on it, and it'll tell you how how you got owned. Armorcarry.com. No, <laughs> let's skip that one. Anyways, um, does anybody want to grab any of this stuff? Feel free to come up later and and uh, grab whatever. This is a camera with a head that I can't get the drivers for. Um, this is supposed to keep cats off of your furniture, but if you have a Maine Coon, they don't hear it. So uh, I bought it, and then I'm like, why is it not working? And the first comment is like, we have a main coon, and they can't hear it because their ears are funny. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it.